This is the most empty place on Earth, the place almost no one goes, Antarctica. It's the last continent discovered by explorers, the last place to be charted and examined and understood, the last place to be inhabited. Even the wildlife here knows this land is different, and perhaps it is a mark of how harsh this land can be that there is no creature here that cannot swim or fly away. This is the last continent on Earth, a refuge of sorts for wilderness and for explorers. Islands. A half dozen times in the last decade or so, they've sailed 900 miles south, five days at sea, to the islands scattered along the famed Antarctic Peninsula. Other expeditions come here with millions of dollars and the power of governments to support them. Sally and Jerome sail by themselves in a small yacht, accompanied only by their children. Three boys, Dion 10, Leaf 8, and DT 5. They trek on remote, rocky islands, trying to learn more about this once unknown and foreboding continent of rock and ice, while there's still time to protect the unique balance of life that exists here. Can you see this, Dennis? I know. It's a long time since I've seen the egg, but I know that they're very big for the size of the bird. Like, they are white like that, though. Yeah? Take your foot too, right? Yeah. Try not to walk on the moss too much, okay? As usual, the Ponces are beginning this voyage in December. High summer and vacation time for the boys, when some days might get as warm as 40 degrees. This will not last long, the Ponces know. Winter and ice are never very distant here. Now development is coming too, as the Ponces will discover anew on this voyage. This last frontier is changing as never before. The Ponces have gradually come to concentrate on the odd and endearing birds that are native to this place. They're concerned now that penguins may become threatened because many countries are claiming interests in the riches that may lie here. The Ponces will use their boat, part research vessel, part home, to search out penguin colonies all along the Antarctic Peninsula. The peninsula reaches up some 700 miles from the continent toward South America. The Ponce's goal is to survey the size of penguin colonies, that is, to count them, all the way to Marguerite Bay at the bottom of the peninsula, even further if the ice will allow them. In earlier voyages, they've found many colonies no one else has ever seen. Deception Island, near the northern end of the peninsula, an early stop for the Ponces, and the site of a big colony of one of the three penguin species dominant on the peninsula, chinstraps. 
Scientists use penguins as a key indicator species to gauge the health of the entire delicate Antarctic ecosystem. To do that, though, they must know how many penguins are actually here. If the penguin population changes radically, the scientists will know something is wrong here. That is why the Ponce sail and climb to these remote places to count the birds. You can do a rough estimate by just counting up groups of, say, 100, and then multiplying up the groups of 100. That's a very rough estimate. If you want to do it properly, though, you've got to map out the area that the colony is occupying and then work out the average density of the colony and multiply it up. Like, well, it's a couple of days' work to do it accurately. But you can get a good estimate if you take your time in a, in a couple of hours. You can get a pretty good estimate of it. But we, we just compare it with colonies we know from elsewhere. Like one in particular with 30 to 40,000 pairs, and it's a lot smaller than this. This is huge. Must be one of the biggest chinstrap penguin colonies down on the peninsula, I think. This one, it's got to be, I think. It's huge. Chinstrap penguins seldom change mates, and they prefer to return to the same nest sites each year to hatch the young. The nests are rings of small stones set just out of pecking range of incubating neighbors. The females usually take the first shift sitting on the eggs, fasting for up to eight days. Then the males take over and the females can feed again. Some of the small shrimp-like krill they find at sea is regurgitated for the penguin chicks. <laughs> Sally does not spend much time with the colonies here on Deception Island though. This time, her work lies further south. Jerome is French, Sally is Australian. They sail aboard the 50-foot steel-hulled Damien II. It can look like a frail ship in amid all the ice and rock, but the ship can take the Ponce's places that others cannot go, which helps them make a living. They charter the boat for scientists doing coastal surveys. Indeed, Jerome knows his way along this coast intimately. He first came here almost 20 years ago, accompanied by his friend Gérard Janichon, who has rejoined him for this voyage. It's unusual to sail in the Antarctic now, but it was truly extraordinary then. Theirs was the first yacht to sail the peninsula coast. The adventure made them heroes in France. Fees from a book allowed each of them to build bigger and better versions of the first vessel. But new boats don't eliminate the four-hour watches throughout this two-month journey, or the sameness of stored food, or the confining conditions of life at sea. These things they simply get used to. But anyone who's lived on a, on a yacht or on a boat Telling you, you get used to shifts, four hours on, four hours off, or whatever you happen to do, and it's just something you get used to. You can't have exactly what you want to eat or drink when you feel like it, or you can't wash every day if you want to, or you can't <laughs> go down to the to the nearest pub for a drink just to get away from it. You just accept that. It is. It might look difficult to people, but I can tell you, for Jerome and perhaps less so for me, it's far more difficult. It would be far more difficult for him to have to get into a car every morning and drive to work. The Damien II averages 26 miles a day now, 
with stops along the way. Working from cove to cove, they arrive at Coverville Island, a breeding site for many, many Gentoo penguins. Their pelts are sleek as fur, but like all penguins, these are true birds. Short, thick feathers help insulate them from the cold, and at the same time lie close to the body to help the speedy swimmers in the water. This will be the first egg, because it's, it's dirtier. Then this looks as though it's the second. The second egg's supposed to be a bit smaller than the, than the first, but they look about the same size, really. That one there, though, she's just about to get off that. You can really tell the difference there. The Gen 2s are apt to form lifelong attachments among breeding pairs. Although they are not so particular about which nest site they use from season to season. On the peninsula, it takes about five weeks for penguin eggs to hatch. The parents watch over them for another month or so, and then leave the chicks in large groups while the parents are off gathering food. One or two months later, the young penguins begin to feed on their own. So beautiful nests. These ones are well made anyway with the stones like that. And they all seem to be just, just sitting right. If you remember the chin straps, at deception, they're all, all mucky, all swelly, <laughs> in all directions. These are all nice and neat and orderly and quiet. They got there, I think, I don't know, you see your dailies later on, but I think these are probably the, the prettiest of the birds. By now, Sally and Jerome have witnessed this cycle of penguin life many times. And still, Antarctica fascinates them. The first time we come with you, we just we put the foot ashore, and that was an achievement for us, and at least. And we are very pleased with that, so... We've been a bit scared, we've been uh, fighting to, to reach Antarctic, and the only thing you want after is come back a bit more confident and go a bit farther. This is what we have done, just going farther and farther, each time knowing a bit more. And when you start to know a place, you, well, it starts to belong to you or you belong to this place. And this is what's happened to us. Often while Sally is counting penguins, the children explore for themselves. At the shore here, they've spotted a leopard seal coming close. He's probably, he's probably waiting for a penguin to come. Then when a penguin comes, he's probably going to get it. Penguins that survive to adulthood may live for 20 years. They're safe on land with practically no predators. But in the sea, there is danger from seals, especially the leopard seal.
Titi is the youngest of the boys. You can watch the giant sea mouse. He is good. Shall we put it back in the water? Leaf, the middle boy, finds that this summer, geology has captured his attention. Dion is the oldest, a budding artist, with an interest in mechanical things also. Some of this Antarctic exploration that the boys share can look dangerous to an outsider. But plainly, Sally and Jerome see great benefits in bringing the children with them. At home in the Falklands, a traveling schoolmaster visits for a couple of weeks every other month or so, with lessons from Sally in between. On board the Damien II, the boys learn about earth science by splashing where boiling volcanic waters mix with the near-frozen sea. Oh. Boys bang away at rock, looking for gold, or fool's gold even, and making plans to get rich and buy firecrackers back at home. Look at that. Just picking up some mica. Here, take it. There's enough money to buy all the devil's bags in the park. You can just see the difference that it's made to them. And coming down here for three months is, is I mean, you see how many people they meet and what they're introduced to and what they're capable of learning. And there's no way, I mean, there, there are other ways of getting the same um, education or the same facts, but this is a very, very good uh, way of getting it, you see. At Foyne Harbour on the peninsula, the boys explore a site left over from one of the first significant human impacts on the Antarctic. It's an old whaler's anchorage, where boats once filled casks with glacier water. The whalers are long gone. The whaling ship lies abandoned where it ran aground. In the hold of the wreck, the boys find dozens of the cone-shaped tips for harpoons that once took tens of thousands of whales in a season until some species were threatened with extinction. At last, international protest put a stop to commercial whaling. And there are signs that the animals may be recovering in the southern oceans. Yeah, you can see the ripples. Just there. The Three humpbacks approach the ship. Their size and curiosity must have made them easy targets for the whalers. This one!
Whale hunting was only among the first human endeavors to mark the Antarctic. Near Palmer Station, an American research site, Dion joins a party of skin divers from the base who are going to see what remains of one of the biggest environmental threats the continent has seen. Actually, we're, we're surveying the wreck today to look for oil spills. Oil and, leaks. And some of the oil leaks, they plugged up with uh, wooden bugs and splash zone last year. The divers are protected as much as possible by their dry suits, but the water is frigidly cold, 33 degrees. Early last year, an Argentine supply ship that doubled as a tourist boat ran aground. Passengers used home video cameras to take these pictures. Within hours, they were rescued, but four days later, the ship had turned on its side. The ship's cargo of diesel oil began to spill. A Chilean Navy ship arrived quickly to contain the damage. But it was a month before Argentine and American crews managed to seal the wreck. It had about 250,000 gallons on board, and they're estimating that about half of that, 125,000, came out uh, when it rolled. It might have been worse if the ship had carried heavy black crude oil instead of diesel fuel. But still, scientists worry that their research will be affected because the once pristine area is no longer so pure. The wreck has gone through a single Antarctic winter, but the damage has been very severe. It's kind of like a, uh, a uh, beer can that's been totally crushed. and. Uh, and there used to be two helicopters there. There's no sign of them at all now, other than two tires. And uh, the heli deck is mostly crushed. And there's no visible signs of oil leaking out anymore. Any cleanup operation would be difficult here. Indeed, all along the peninsula, it's clear that very often, no one bothers to clean the mess that is left behind. The penguins hardly seem to notice, but nevertheless, many environmentalists are concerned that we may spoil the last really large wilderness left on Earth before we begin to understand it. The Damien II has been at sea for about a month, with dozens of stops so far for penguin surveys. Now Jerome has set course for Dream Island, about halfway down the peninsula. The island has a large colony of the third species of penguins the Ponces are counting, Adelis. Two young males fighting. That's oh, that's really good. That's fantastic up there. There are remarkable elephant seal colonies here also, and for the seals too, the Antarctic summer is the season of the young. Well, it's a bit slippery in all this muck, especially where the penguins have been. Now, I don't want you to fall in that. Oh, you're right, there's a weenie. They've been uh, fed by their mothers until they're sort of round, slug-like things, really fat, and the mothers go off and leave them, and they have to survive on the, the reserves they've made during the, <laughs> the feeding time. They're just on the mother's milk, and they lie around on the beaches in groups. They're really, really sweet. <laughs> 
children quite like them. They're very beautiful to look at at that stage. As they get a bit older, they're not so nice. Any more chin straps over this way, though? They seem to be confined to that area back there. So I think I'll go back on the point and stop for the road. It's too wet. In the water by the beach, young male seals play at combat. They are too young now to really harm one another. Later, when they develop the droopy noses that account for the elephant seal's name, they will fight seriously for groups of females. the Ponces find sites of earlier explorers, many of them no longer in use. This cabin was once a research station, but it's been deserted for a long time. Inside, there are copies of letters and dispatches that are decades old. She'll be returning home about June and anticipate finding civilization somewhat bewildering. So we'd like to be considered for service as relief warden at a small hostel in the Highlands. It's the kind of thing now, you know, over 30 years since it was put up, and it really is the kind of thing now you could say it's part of the history of this place and it should, really should be preserved and looked after to keep it like this. And all this food, you never get food like this again in boxes. No one eats this kind of stuff anymore. But it's still here and this is how a British base worked 30 years ago. And it's really worthwhile keeping, doing something about the men who lived and worked in bases like these were taking part in an extraordinary study effort in the Antarctic, led by a dozen countries during the International Geophysical Year, 1957. The scientists paved the way for governments to go on cooperating, and eventually there was an Antarctic Treaty. It's worked ever since to hold Antarctica as a scientific reserve. Today, tourist ships send groups like this one from New York's Museum of Natural History ashore to the sites where once only scientists went. Antarctica's past and present meet here and perhaps show the way to the future as well. Some environmentalists want to see the entire continent now made into a world park. No development or exploitation allowed. The Antarctic to remain as it is, a place for research. And for amateur naturalists to see the greatest unspoiled wilderness left.
Some of the old geophysical year stations are still operating. The British base Faraday, for instance, plays a role in researching the periodic huge loss of ozone in the atmosphere over the southern polar region. Further south, another British base, Rothera, serves as a headquarters for inland science projects that can only be reached by plane. The flights take off from a runway cleared from the glacier, with a path well marked so the aircraft doesn't slide into one of the nearby crevasses that split the surface. From the air, an observer easily sees the extent of one of the great treasures and paradoxes of Antarctica, ice. This is the driest continent. Hardly any snow or rain ever falls. But what does fall is frozen in place and remains. So Antarctica is both the continent with the least precipitation and the one with the most water, almost all of it locked up in ice. Some estimates are that 70% of the world's fresh water is here. The ice here on the plateau also provides an ancient atmospheric record that's key to studying new phenomena such as the greenhouse effect. These operations are just underway. When full drilling begins, the scientists will be able to plunge the drill bit through centuries to see what changes have occurred over time. the Damien II again, the Antarctic summer is progressing, although it is still not dark after midnight. Indeed, Jerome calls this the planet of light. few stops left for the travelers, one of them a special place for Sally and Jerome. More than 10 years ago, on their first voyage to the Antarctic together, they decided to stay over in the long darkness of winter. They had only the Damien II for a base, frozen in a harbor, here at Avian Island. It was a really big surprise for us to see just how many penguins there were or how many birds there were on, on that island, we really surrounded by them. They found extraordinary life, including 70,000 a daily penguins on the island. Avian is located at the top of Marguerite Bay, and it's the breeding ground for much of the bird life that lives and hunts throughout the Bay region. If something happened here, it could seriously affect bird life in the entire Bay Area. Besides the dailies, there were giant petrels and cormorants, gulls, skewers, and every single bit of that island's covered in birds. And you're surrounded by birds, and you really do live part of that cycle of the summer season with, with them completely. I don't know, whoever comes here to look at the birds will realise that these, these, the giant petrels here are more wary than others anywhere yeah. else, really. I see. That, you know, a... perhaps but the Ponces are disturbed to learn the birds may soon be sharing the island. A Chilean scientist from a nearby base is examining avian as a possible site for future studies. 
I don't. It depends what they want to do. If it's, if it's going to be Sally and Jerome are beginning to worry that the many scientists and bases could soon overwhelm the fragile wilderness they have come to study. Jerome navigates the Damien II through the mouth of a narrow passage at Terra Firma Island. They are very far south now, nearly at the base of the peninsula, where conditions are terribly harsh. Some years, the sea is frozen solid here. The air is very cold. Nonetheless, small patches of grass and pearl wart flourish here. Unexceptional in any way, except that these are the southernmost flowering plants known to exist anywhere. The furthest outpost of green in a world that is almost all grays and blacks and ice white. It was the Ponces who made this discovery and reported it to the scientific world. Although they now realize this too may draw others. People have to realize what this is and realize how they can damage it if they come too close and how they can keep away and still enjoy it. There's a bit of a compromise to do it and it, you can't just ban people from coming to certain places all over just because they might damage it. They've got to be taught how not to damage it so that they can come in and enjoy it. Many explorers must pause to wonder a little at what they do and at what will be done by those who inevitably will follow. Not many will follow this far, however. The Damien II is entering what is called pack ice, a great plain that's frozen, not quite solid. You can feel that, that you're very far south, and there's no one else in the pack, and you are nothing much more than another little bit of ice. And you, you can really feel it as a living thing. You can feel it, you can see it moving up and down with the swell as though it's, it's breathing. And you see animals in it, the whales, which come up to breathe just behind the boat because there's no other space for it. And penguins on it. Look there. What is that? Oh, how it The steel hull of the ship allows it to smash its way through. The ice will get worse soon as it gets colder, and then it will not be possible to get through at all. Jerome must judge what is safe. Hey, look at the size of it, Look at the size of it. Oh, yeah, gone as far as they can. The Damien II must turn back toward King George Island. Ice flows look almost impenetrable.
Once you've been through a really bad storm and just got out, or you had to go through a lot of ice and just managed to get through, and the next day is beautiful weather. Each time it is really very gratifying each time and it's very satisfying. And you really feel as if you've earned what you've done. It's the feeling of it being very difficult here and you've managed to win through in spite of that. But all along the peninsula, it is clear that as with all frontiers, this one is developing. In the time since they left the British base at Rothera, perhaps the biggest cargo ship ever to come this far south has arrived and begun unloading bulldozers and rock crushers and housing for construction workers. What is it? That's the water cabin like thing to live in that they're taking ashore. They're taking their own accommodation House. ashore. <laughs> well, I propose a whiskey for that. To celebrate the invasion of the Antarctic. The small landing strip on the snowfield above Rothera is to be replaced by a gravel runway, so bigger planes can come and go regularly. It will mean blasting away part of a hillside. But the scientists say it must be done if their work is to go on. The Antarctic Treaty, which has worked to protect the polar region for three decades, may be reviewed next year. Some countries are interested in exploring for oil here, or for minerals. Already, there is an agreement for exploitation that the treaty nations are considering. Some think offshore drilling for oil is certain, and that that is going to mean the greatest change yet for Antarctica. Oh, we are next to the first area, actually, where oil will be exploited. It's next to this uh, sedimentary depot, so we'll be some oil rig somewhere here. And maybe this one will die with cover with oil, like that. Or we will be starving, very angry, because there'll be no more food. After that, we'll be our children. Meanwhile, building goes ahead especially on King George Island, the Damien II's final destination. If you look at what's happening at Rothera, if you look what's happening here, this is the, the first steps in, in opening the place up, that's for sure. What, to what, I don't know. The rest of the world is still over the horizon, but it seems to get closer every day. Frontiers are wild places. Once we thought they were all savage and needed conquering. This one doesn't seem so savage anymore. Before it's conquered, it may be worth asking what the conquest would mean. And perhaps we should ask too, what will happen to the explorers? Indeed, to all of us, when the frontiers are gone.
Thank you.